Let us pray. Oh, our Heavenly Father, the cross is greater than any sin we could possibly imagine or commit. The cross of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lord, will cleanse us from all sin. How thankful we are for that today, Father. Don't let anybody take us away from the grace of God in that issue. For by grace we've been saved through faith and not of herself. It's a gift, not of works. The boast never goes to us, Father. It always goes to you, and we bring it to you in this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you go to the book of 1 Thessalonians with me. We are in the fifth chapter winding up the study of this book. First Thessalonians 5. If you have a study guide, always remember to pick a study guide up when you come in. We're in verse 11 through 13 today. Here's what Paul says. I'm picking up 13. I'm picking up verse 11. We covered that last week, but I want to pick it up and pull it in. Uh, when he says, therefore, he is bringing a conclusion or a summary of the first 10 verses. And we're going to use it as a bridge over to verse 12 and 13. Therefore, I encourage verse 11. Therefore, that's the word therefore. Always ask you, when you see the word therefore, always say why for. When you see the word therefore, or ask yourself why for. And the why for is behind it. Verses 1 through 10 is the is therefore, the why for is the therefore there is verses 1 through 10. We've studied that. Therefore, encourage one another. That's in the body of Christ, that members of the church, the body of Christ, therefore, encourage one another. Watch, that's number one. And number two is to build up one another. And then he applauds them just as you are doing. All right, that's verse 11. Then verse 12. But we request, he makes a request. We request of you, brethren, that's the, that's the body of Christ, the church, because they all have the same Father God. They, that we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate, that you appreciate those who diligent labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instructions and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. He's talking to, he addresses in this passage, he addresses the pastor teacher and the congregation and their relationship to one another. Their relationship. Now, here's what we want to do with this lesson today. Remember that we're in the final conclusions, and this is really important, when we, when we went from verse 11, we used it as a bridge sentence to 12 to 28. We're at the very end of this book. And he's, he goes through an interesting, he does an interesting thing. From verses 12 through 28, now listen to me, he issues 18 present imperatives. Those are commands in the Greek language. There are 18 present imperatives. Command after command after command after command. These are commands. The imperative is commands. The final one in verse, I think it's verse 26. The final uh, one he issues, all of them are present imperatives except for the last one. And that's an aorist imperative. And over the weeks that we are coming to us, we'll look at these and discuss them because this is what Paul felt it was important to say to the congregation after telling them the importance of the pastor teacher and the congregation getting on the same page in the word of God and in their life. Then he goes into a discussion on it. In our passage today, 12 and 13, he issues the first three of 18 imperatives or commands. We're going to see that today. All right? 
We're going to take a look at that. In verses 11 through 28 is what I'm saying. Paul turned his attention to giving command instructions, 18 imperatives. That's a command in the Greek language. Let's look at five things today before we go home. Now, we won't go home at halftime, okay? We'll go downstairs and have coffee and donuts. We'll come back and finish this study uh, and then go home. All right. Number one, in today's lesson, the first three of the 18 imperatives given to close out his book of First Thessalonians is given by Paul in verse 12. When I, well, let me tell you, first of all, when you look at these verses 11, 12, and 13, there are three Greek sentences, but they're written a little different. Yeah, and, and you can see them in the, in the Greek. Here's what's often missed. Look at verse 13. In the middle of that verse is a period. See, verse 11 has got a period. Then verse 12 has got a comma. In the middle of 13 is a period. And then at the end of verse 13 is a period. So that's very interesting because sometimes we miss that. So when you're looking at verse 11, 12, and 13, what you have are three Greek sentences. And, you, and a lot of times you can't see them in the English, but this time we can. That's important. Sometimes we miss a period in the middle of a verse. So I, I call that to your attention. All right? And remember, all of the imperatives are all going to be present except for the last one in the book. It's going to be an aorist imperative. In verse 11, he uses an interesting phrase for the word therefore. Deo, D-I-O. Now, normally, I told you last week, normally, uh, therefore is the Greek word un, O-U-N. But he does something different here, and he would normally, normally this would be un, but it's D-I-O. It's a compound word that means because of this. Because of this. And we talked about that last week. I, I don't want to go back and, and do a whole new study. But because of verses 1 through 10, which we have studied in detail, because of this, right? Especially, look at verse 6. Here's was his point. So then let us not sleep with others. Remember that spiritual apathy in the church. But let us be alert and sober-minded. See, that was his... If there was ever a point that Paul was going to bring back into the, the close, that would be it. All right? Be alert. Don't be in spiritual apathy. See, the way things are going right now in America, it would be easy for the church to go into spiritual apathy unless you see what's going on. If you see what's going on, the need for the gospel of Jesus Christ is greater today than probably most any time I've known since the 60s in my ministry. In the 60s, there was a great need because of what was going on in uh, the cities across of America. There was a great need to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the streets. Everybody was going to the street. It was only natural that the, the church should go to the street with these people and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And listen, preachers were going to the street. I went to the street. I, w I went to the street. Rick Hughes went to the street. There was a bunch of us in the 60s that we went to where the, the people were and the argument was because the solution is always the gospel of Jesus Christ. You got marriage problem? Gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Then the issue is not that you need to be saved. The issue is you need to know how to be spiritual. You need to know how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and stop walking in the flesh. Only thing that tear up marriages is walking in the flesh. Listen, there's a great need for the gospel of Jesus Christ to get out there. The homes are falling apart. The children, all over, they don't know what to do with it. Listen, the gospel needs to go to the street. 
The gospel has always been the street ministry. Jesus was a street preacher, right? Have you studied the life of Christ in the Bible? He was a street preacher. And I don't mean he spent all his time on the street. I mean, he, he went wherever people gathered. He went wherever they gathered. No matter why they were gathering, he went to where the gathering was. Listen, the Apostle Paul, if you study his, his mission work, that's what he did. He went where the people were. If the people were by the, the ocean, he went there. If he went there, he went there. And finally, he got enough attractions that wherever he went, people came. But he, he always was interested where the crowds are. He became, he became a good enough evangelist that where he was, the crowds came to him. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we got two imperatives. The word therefore. Therefore, because of verse 1 through 4, we, because we don't need to be in spiritual apathy, we need to be sober Mind it. We need to be alert and sober-minded, not, not sitting around a spiritual apathy and complaining. Stop complaining about everything and get out there and do something about it. You know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, and we're just making handbaskets. We got to quit that stuff. We got to get out there and mix and mingle. That's what we got to do. You know, mix and mingle not because you're single, but because you got a message. And so we need to do that. And so here's what he says to the church. Get out of being, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of what you're doing and let's get back out there where the people are. Let's get out there and let's, let's heal the marriages. Let's heal the families. Let's bring them to Christ who is the great healer of everything. And we got to do that, people. We've got to do that. Therefore, encourage, that's, notice that's a present active imperative. IMPV is imperative, it's just shortcut. Second person plurally speaking to the congregation. He says, encourage, therefore, encourage one another, that's within the body of Christ, and build up, that's a building, a pro, that's building, a building up spiritually, starting on the foundation, which is Jesus, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3, Start with the foundation, which is Christ. No other foundation but Christ. And build it up spiritually. Milk doctrines, milk doctrines, meat doctrines, into spiritual maturity where people are able to take the word of God within their own souls. Because the word of God, if it doesn't work in you, it won't work from you. The word of God is given to you so that it works in you to change your life. And when that happens, it works out of you because people want to know how did your life get so dramatically changed, right? Other people who meet you think you've been this way your whole life because you wear the word of God by faith. You walk by faith, not by sight. And let me tell you what people are looking for. They're not looking for what sight can get them. They're looking for what faith can give them. They're looking for what faith can. Everybody is into sight. They got nothing. So he says, encourage one another and build one another up. That's the pastor building the church and the church building one another. Okay. That's got to be a team effort. It's got to be a team effort. Verses 12, 13a, because there's a period. We request of you, brethren. Now, he makes a request. We request of you, brethren. Notice Adelphos is a family word. That's his brother's royal family of God. He's addressing the church, the royal family of God in the world. That you, second person plural, the congregation, appreciate those pastor teachers who diligently labor among you to do what? To, to encourage you and to build you up. And have charge over you. How? In the Lord. In the Lord. The pastor teacher has charge over the congregation only in the Lord. 
and give you congregation, second person plural, instructions that you esteem them, pastor teachers, very highly in love. Here's verse, here's the second part of that verse, 13, B, because there's a period, remember, live in peace. There's the word live in peace, present active imperative, second person plural, with one another, with one another. I want you to do something. I want you to do something because you're missing this. In verse 11, look at verse 11 on your paper. Circle the one, circle one another. Put a circle around it. Then go down to verses 12 and 13. Look through that. Do you find one? Okay. Look at verse 13. You find one? In verse 11, you should have circled two. And in verse 13, you should have circled one. So what's his emphasis? His emphasis is on the body of Christ, the congregation, and the pastor-teacher being on the same page of encourage and build one another up. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual work. It's, it's, not, it's not emotional and goofiness. It's based on your growth in the word of God and your identity with the body of Christ because of your growth emphasis and the truth of the word of God that's working in your soul. This is why you're a part of this congregation. That's exactly why you're a part of this congregation. That's why you drive past a church to come here. And that should be a good thing for you because you're hungry for the Word of God. Because it is the Word of God in your soul that sets you free and allows you to be the one who sets other people free. The Word of God. Listen, John 8:32. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. And once you find that key to freedom, you want other people. You want to give that key away, don't you? This is the key that unlocks your bondage, sets you free. It did for me. It did for me. One another. Encourage one another. Build one another. The pastor teacher should be on that page. The congregation should be on that page. Point number two. In the fifth chapter, 12 and 13, and then a period, Paul offered a request. Watch this now from the Pauline team. If you go back and look at that carefully in verse 12 and 13, he didn't say, as he often does, I, Paul. I, Paul. No, he used we. We request. Because Paul understands the importance from a leadership standpoint of spiritual leadership that the men in leadership and him have to be on the same page. Paul and his missionary team has to be on the same page in encouraging, building one another up in their ministry. He brings that concept to the church and says it to the pastor, teacher, and the congregation. Why? He was the guy with the Paul and team that walked into a city he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. People got saved and a church developed out of it called the church at Thessalonica. And that little church became a lighthouse for God in what we call Greece, in Macedonia and Archaea. That little church. We've talked about that. In the word request, it's interesting. 
I wrote it on your paper in the Greek language, eroteo. It's a present active indicative. Now that's going to be important as first person plural, we, because it's a main verb. We call it a finite verb. And that's important if you got other dynamics of verbs. A main verb, because any other verbs that aren't main verbs are going to work off a main verb. What One main verb, everything else is attached to it. Participles, infinitives, they're all attached to it. He does this, he's making a request to both the pastor teacher at the church of Thessalonica and the congregation. The request was issued in two parts, one to the pastor teacher and one to the congregation. And he says, you've got to be on the same page with the word of God and what your missions are. To the congregation, to the pastor teacher, he says, appreciate and esteem them very highly in love, not because of their personality, but because of their work how they are developing the Word of God in your life for spiritual growth. Uh. Hundred and twenty pound kids goes to the gym. Hundred and twenty pound kid goes to the gym. He wants to play football. He's a big tall boy which says you can put meat on him and you can put some muscle on him. And he says, I, 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 I'm 120 pounds and I want to play tackle at Hoover High School or Moody High School or wherever you are. If the guy's really true to the kid, he can say, well, look, I can get you probably big enough to be a running back or a defensive position out there if you've got speed but I can only put so much muscle and meat on your bones. But if a big kid comes in there, right, Willie? A big kid's coming there. He's a 6'1 kid. You can get him there. You stay with me four years, I'll get you there. I get, I get you there. If you're a good trainer, you know you can put meat and muscle on a kid. If you got a frame, you got, got to have foundation, but you can put meat and muscle on him. But it's got to take what? Work. It takes a lot of work. And suppose he wants to play two sports, like my grandson. He wanted to be a lineman, but he also wanted to wrestle. He wanted to be a lineman at 250 and wrestle at 175. How are you going to do that? So he flip-flopped for two years back and forth with that weight. He'd jump up there to about two, then have to get rid of it. So the coach sets him down one day and says, you got to choose which one you want, son. It's going to wreck your health. You choose football. It's sophomore year. you got to choose fo football or you got to choose wrestling. Because... You got the body of a lineman, but you got the heart of a linebacker. So Ty chose to play football and put on the 250. Eh? Now he's working like crazy to get it off. What, 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 what is that about? It's about work and heart. You know, you're going to have the heart for something. Go, oh, really? After it, in about, about two tries, you never show up again. That's, that's the way the church is. There's, there's labor intensity in it. But, but listen, the labor intensity of learning the word of God, first, it changes you. And if it changes you and you begin to see, well, hey, I'm getting some, I'm getting some muscle mass. And when I came in, I, I couldn't lift my weight. Now I can lift mine. And now I can lift his. And, you know, now you get kind of encouraged about it. It, once you begin to see the word of God put muscle mass on you and put faith in you and, and that type of thing, then you go, look, there's something to this. I know that was true in my life. Then you begin to work at it. Then you really begin to work at it. 
And then other people go like, well, how did you, how did you do that? And you go like, well, let me share it with you. And the first thing you know, you got a little Bible study going someplace because somebody else wants to do it. And so this is what we have. So there's a request goes out and he says, I want you to appreciate the work that they do and esteem them. Is it them? Is it, is their person? No, it's their work. Listen to the word. This word appreciates kind of an interesting word in English because it's oida in the Greek. Oida. The word oida is the perfect tense of horeo and horeo means to see something with a mind. You know, Somebody wants you to understand a mathematical thing, and you can't quite get it. And so he says, he stops, and he goes like, well, look, this is how this thing works. This is best a kid in class, not a teacher. Teachers overthink. It's another kid in the class that goes like, I'll tell you how, you, how, how this works. You do this and this and this and this, and there's, there's your answer. And you go like, well, how come they couldn't just say, I know. They, they get nerdy with it. See, I do that. I, do, I get nerdy with this stuff. It's the practical part I'm after, and I get nerdy with it myself. But listen, oid is one of those things. It means to see, it means to see where you understand something. Oh, I get it. I got it now. Because once you get something, you got it. Once you get it. Well, I, can't, I don't understand it. Instead of walk away, keep after it. Listen, at some point, it just rings a bell. Boom, I got it. Once you get it, you never forget it. You know why? Because you cycled it from your mind to your heart. And when it gets in your heart, it's there. And it's very hard to get it out of your heart once it's there. It's very, very hard to get out. Oida is horeo in the perfect tense. That's completed actually the past the result it remains completed forever. When you get that, see, that's from the mind to the heart. That's, that's the perfect tense of voida. You see something with clarity and get it, and it becomes an important doctrinal principle for your life. This congregation has grown spiritually in categorical Bible doctrine to understand with clarity the divine appointment of the spiritual gift of a mature pastor teacher of a congregation to which they're a member. Listen, there's a lot of pastors out there. There's a lot of preachers in the pulpit. And listen, a lot of them doing a pretty good job. Are you, but listen, for you, if you want to grow, you've got the foundation of Christ. If you want to grow, you've got to send her to a pastor. Teacher understands milk and meat and teaches it for your growth. You've got to do that. And that's why you're sitting here. You drive past churches that are much finer than ours, got more people, got more everything. But what you want is the teaching of the word of God to build your your stamina and your courage. I'm a trainer. And it takes work to get there. But listen, every day you should see the benefit of it. You should see the benefit of taking the word of God in and walking it out by faith. You should see the benefit of it. And when you do, you're, become, you're, going, to, you're going to be a lifetime prescriber to it. Because it's changing the way you deal with people. It changed how you deal within your relationships. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, a changer. The word esteem is an interesting word, and he and he puts it. He trails with it, esteem very highly in love. This word esteem, in the Greek language, it it, it is an acknowledgement of the position of divine delegated authority. It's dealing with the headship of Jesus Christ. The Greek word I put on your paper for the word esteem is an attitude you have about the position the pastor teacher holds. It's never about the person who holds it. It's about the, the position the person holds. And in that position requires certain things from that pastor teacher. He's got to teach. He's got to understand a very, he's got to have a very solid gospel. He's got to have an understanding of male doctrines that babies need to grow up and meat doctrines that laborers for Christ need to have. This is, listen, you can find this in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, 13 and 14. In the book of Hebrews, you can find this. And so what you, what you esteem is not 
the person or the personality. It's the position that he holds because at some point you believe that God has brought the two of you together, that the pastor, teacher, and you, God has brought you together for your spiritual growth, mature ministry of your life. And there, I couldn't convince you of that. It's not my job to convince you of that. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict you that we're a right match for this time in your life. And when he does that, because it is the work he produces that develops your spiritual character, that you esteem about it. But you don't have to know me personally one way or the other to esteem what I do. It's not in my person or personality. It is in my work. The proof's in the pudding. If it's not, leave it alone. That's what I'm saying. And that you esteem them very highly in love, right? And then he's going to go to a because. Now, Listen to me. One of my favorite verses is 2 Peter 3.18. Grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. These two things ought to be paralleled in your life in pursuing and growing in. Grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of the Lord. We, we, listen, here's growing in grace, knowing the six stages of grace and growing in them. Listen, you can't grow in something you don't know about. You grow in grace. You understand the six stages of grace. Say? And knowledge. Do you understand the difference between milk doctrines and meat doctrines? And where does that take me? It takes me to spiritual maturity in the work of the Lord. I mean, you got to set somewhere where there's clarity to that because this is what Paul is talking about. This is what Paul is talking about. So, Here's Jesus, and, and we're going to take a break. Here's Jesus in John 21, 15 through, I put on your paper 15 through, I don't know, 17 or something like that. He has died on a cross. He's been buried. He's been raised from the dead. He's in 40 days of post-resurrection appearance. He's getting ready to go back to the Father. He's getting ready to go to heaven. One of those UF, UFO trips. He's about ready to go back to heaven. And it's a conversation with Peter. Right? That famous conversation with Peter. But he had a lot of famous conversations with Peter. This was positive. A lot of times they weren't always positive. Get behind me, Satan was one of them. That wasn't too positive. That, that, that one didn't go well for Peter. Jesus asked Peter a question. Do you love me? That's famous, right? Do you love me? And he asked him, agape, and Peter answered, philos. Jesus is asking about divine love, and Peter's responding about human love. Peter didn't really do a good job with that one, did he? Huh? When we dealt with our Eucharist today, we said, in the night in which he was betrayed. Nice. Peter was part of that betrayal, wasn't he? And he swore an oath before God that he would never betray Jesus, and he did. I mean, the words weren't even cold before he did. Now they're having this conversation. Jesus said, do you love me? Peter, do you understand the love that's required from you to me? Peter, do you understand the love that's required from you to me? I'm telling you today the love that God is required from you to me and from me to you and from you to you to you to you is agape. Esteem them very in love. Now listen. Peter responds, you know I would go through a burning bush. I'd go through a burning building. I'd go through burning. Yeah, I know. He says, feed.
We're talking about love, and you're talking about food. You, 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 you ask me a love question, and now you're at lunch. So Jesus asked him again, do you love me? Because you've got to understand the love that's required. So he gives him the philos again. Because he's telling Jesus, without acknowledging it, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I don't get it. And so he, he talks about food again. He says, feed. If you love me, you will demonstrate that love for me. And what I did when I came to the earth, you will demonstrate it by feeding those that get saved. My sheep. My sheep. You will demonstrate your love for me. Agape love is the way you demonstrate the love you have for him by doing the work the Lord has assigned to you. Then Peter, feed my sheep. See, this is what this is about. This is what this is about. It's, it's, it's about loving the Lord in a way that connects us with the work of the Lord. It's loving each other in a way that connects us with the work of the Lord. That brings honor to him. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's not, it's, it's not about, it's about one another in the Lord. In point number three of our lesson, the next thing Paul laid out was three primary ministries of the pastor teacher to, the, to advance them in their spiritual growth as a congregation. So here's what you should be looking for in the life of a pastor teacher. Diligent labor. Diligent labor. Notice it's a participle. It's a present active participle. The word and in the Greek is kind of interesting because sometimes it's used adjunctively. It means it's connecting, like in this case, two participles. Two participles. And listen, he's going to do it again to connect three. Notice adjunctive. It means it's connecting two things into one idea of thought. Number one, diligent labor. I mean, does your pastor work hard at meeting your spiritual needs uh, as a congregation? Uh, foundational doctrines of salvation, the clear gospel and foundational doctrines, milk, and then meat, and it taking you to advance where you're able to feel a sense of maturity about missions or ministry work? Are you at that level that he can do that with you? And you feel comfortable. I feel like I'm spiritually prepared for that. You think to yourself, I think I can do that. What gives you the confidence is the word of God in your soul that's worked for you that you know confidence. You can go with confidence and say, this will work for you. Like when I show the gospel of Jesus Christ, how it changed people's life. I speak personally. You know, here's what Christ did for you. But listen, this is what, he, this is what Christ did for everybody, but this is what he did for me. And um, so that's important. Diligent work. Pastor needs to be diligent in his work. And that he has charge over you. He has charge over you. In, but listen to me. In the Lord. There's a big difference between having charge over you and having charge over you in the Lord. And what does that mean? It means I hold the position given to me by the Lord. I have the gift teacher. I have the position pastor. The word pastor is just an under shepherd of 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, the chief shepherd. I'm an under shepherd, uh, but I, and I believe it uh, with all my soul that I've been appointed by the Lord to this church for the length of time I've been here. Listen, I know I don't do this with you, but every year I talk to the Lord about renewing my contract. 
I never thought I would ever be in one, one church 47 years. I wasn't trained theologically to think that way. I was trained to think four or five years and you move on. But so every year, January, I became pastor of this church uh, in 19, uh, 1974 in January. Every January, I sat down with the Lord and go over the contract with him. I don't have a contract with you. You can, you, can, you know, I, I'm day to day here. But with him, I talk about a yearly contract. And a lot of times offers come in. People would like to have me come teach with them. And I, you know, I have to sit down and go over that again with him. I mean, is this is how, is this how we do this? I mean, I don't know. I've only, you know, I've only been married to one church. <laughs> So I don't know, how does this work? So here's my point. I hold a position that the Lord gave me. Nobody called me. I get calls. <laughs> but the Lord sends me or I don't go. If, if he don't send me, the call has to come from the Lord. I get calls, but I have to make sure the call is from the Lord before I go do something. And so far, I haven't. So far, I felt like I, I'm the guy for this responsibility, at, le at least on a year-to-year -year basis. This is what I do. That's how I do it. I don't know any other way to do it. Uh, but I, 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 I do with him because he called me. Now I, had, I got gifted at salvation. I got the gift of teacher. But I got the call to be a pastor. I got it from the Lord. I got it from the Lord. I mean, I really got it from the Lord. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that on anybody the way I got it from the Lord. So have charge of me. And what, and what you care about, is this the guy the Lord has sent? Does, is he gifted? Is he mature? Can he take me to where I need to go, where I can have ministry out of my life? I work really hard at that. I work really hard at not only developing my spiritual growth but my, as a teacher, but my growth as a pastor to be able to be, uh, to be able to mentor you in ministry. I spend a lot of time on that. And, and then to give you instructions, to give you instructions. That's really important to give you instructions. And I, I try to base everything. You know, I get, I get more criticism, and it surprises me a little bit. I get more criticisms for teaching out of the Bible. Is that not crazy? Well, he's still in the book of 1 Thessalonians. The Lord ain't come back yet. And guess what? When you get to heaven, you know the one book you're going to study all the time? Da, da 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 One book in the library. It's the Bible. Matthew 24, 35. You know what I love about it in Hebrew? Not one jot or tittle. When I, tech, when I took textual, textual criticism in, in my theological training, I nearly died. Those people were so disgusting to me because all they did is attack the Word of God. I mean, they attacked. I had a lot of friends that I went through my theological training with that wasn't sure the Bible was w worth listening to. And then God in his marvelous grace, gave me that Matthew 5, 18, thereabout. Not one jot and tittle. Now, a jot and a tittle in the Hebrew language are the things you have to get a magnifying glass out to see. Right, William? 
we're in Hebrew class right now, and I tell you, those little dots, the older you get, the smaller they get. Not, and they're the, they're the, the quirkiest little things. And boy, you got to pay attention because the whole word is based on these little quirky things. That's called a jot and a tittle. A King James, jot and tittle. Not a jot. And, we would say dot and I and cross and a T. That's what we would say, right? You know, jot and dot. They still say that? I don't know. Who cares? Who cares? Jot and a tittle. The word of God. Don't let anybody tell you that this is not the word of God. Don't let anybody tell you this is not the word of God. Not one jot or tittle can be changed. You know how many times they've, they've burned the Bible? Do you know, I was reading the other day, do you know, you talk about the, the wonderful thing of this, one of the good parts about the speed of electronics, you know, what we can do with electronics, amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a curse in a lot of ways. Facebook, for example. But the side for the church of Jesus Christ, there, there is only just a few languages in the world of the smallest countries of the world where it hasn't been translated into their language. The word of God is covering the, the world in light speed in their own language because of electronics. They can do it at such light speed. Get it, they can get it translated and then out, just like that. They've never seen anything like it. The speed of translating the word of God is just enormous today. I thought I'd bring you some good news from the media. <laughs> There's not much, you were not gonna find that on CBN, but anyhow, there it is. And he says, because of this, diligently labor, charge over you in the Lord. Not, they're not in charge over you. They're in charge over the, in the Lord. And they give you instructions. These you esteem very highly because, he says, because of their work. Because of their work. Esteem very highly because of their diligent labor, not their personality. I, I, if you would get that, I'm safe. The pastor teacher of a church congregation does not work for them, but to them for the Lord. I've never asked a penny to preach the word of God, never will. I've always lived on what I was given. I am thankful for you. You have been more honorable to me than I could possibly imagine. I take what I need and I don't take what you give me. I'm criticized because I do it that way. What about the next pastor comes along? You say you're only willing to take that amount. What about the next guy that comes along? Well, that's his problem. <laughs> I'm just trying to take care of the flock I got and the time I got. I only take what I need. I only take what I need. If you've served on my board, you know that. You, you, then you know that. Well, we're, we're the pastor teachers of the congregation. I work for the Lord. I work for the Lord. I don't sign a contract with you every year. You sign it with me, you don't show up. <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do people in the church vote? Well, they, they take the money away from you and they, they don't come. After a while, you don't have anybody. Then you say, oh, I guess, I guess I'm done. We'll see. Here's some passages you should read about the gift and the office. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, Romans 12, 7, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. You should read 2 Corinthians 10, 8. That's a worth a read for you. Well, there can be many spiritually gifted teachers among a congregation, and we've always had them. There's only one pastor teacher over it. And the Lord assigns them. 
He holds the office and responsibility as a pastor teacher to the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. He's part of the, the headship of Christ. The pastor teacher is. Not because you have the gift of teacher, because you hold the position of pastor. You need to really get that squared away in your soul. The pastor teacher's work is evaluated by the Lord, both in time and eternity. 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, actually 3 and 4, but 4th chapter 1 through 5 and 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, judgment seat of Christ, 1 Peter 5, 4. If he's done a job according to the word of God, he gets a crown. Listen, you never get a crown without a cross. If you don't bear the cross, you'll never get a crown. You've got to bear the cross, man. You want the crown without the cross? That ain't gonna, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. You got to bear the cross to, to, to wear a crown. Point number four. One doctrinal point that Paul is making to both the pastor, teacher, and the congregation is to be of one mind in the Lord. What gives us unity in the church is the Word of God. The Word of God. And you do that by cycling the word of God by faith. And Paul talks about sound doctrine. That is doctrine that is healthy for your soul that you can grow with. You always pay attention to that. You need to read Titus 1, 9 through 11, Romans 5, 5 through 7. Being of one mind in the Lord guards against divisions and quarreling within the church body. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 6, the 10th and, and verses 10 through 13. You know, Paul had a real, you know, what's interesting when Paul is writing, the, the, when he's, when he's writing, Thess, writing Thessalonians, the book of Thessalonians, he's doing, it for, he's doing it from Corinth. I mean, he's just that, and the Thessalonian church was like, wonderful. The problems they were having were minute compared to the larger church at at uh, Corinthian, at uh, Corinth, and for closing, it is the responsibility of the congregation to know the qualifications of a pastor teacher, whether choosing one for the congregation or choosing one to set under for your spiritual growth maturity. It is important to know the qualification. It is amazing to me. I used to go out to do interviews for churches. And they didn't even know, they, listen, many of them had no idea what to look for in a pastor. None. Based on the word of God. And I would have to sit down and teach them. I'd say, well, look, I know why the Lord sent me to you. It's not to be your pastor. It's to be your teacher. So I would get them to get a Bible out. We'd have to go find them. Get a Bible out. And I would teach them the qualifications of the pastor. I said, listen, next time you call a pastor teacher for this church, these are the qualifications you must look for. And I would spend an hour, hour, two hours with them, teaching them how to qualify. Listen, these were... So be sure, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Titus 1, 6 through 9, and of course my favorite verse, 2 Peter 3, 18, growing grace and knowledge. I mean, these are the, you'll read those for the qualification of a pastor teacher. Now he can have the gift. But, you know, you assume he's got the gift, but don't assume it. Ask him. But he's got the gift of teacher. But does he have the qualifications to be a pastor? He could be a great teacher and not be a great pastor. And, and let me tell you, you can spend, there's a, just from my own experience, there's a whole lot more learning about being a pastor than it is about teaching is easy. Pastoring is difficult. And you can learn it. You learn that from the conversation that Jesus had with Peter about taking care of the sheep. And how important it is to be on the same page. Listen, I need to be on the same page with the Lord and you need to be on the same page with me and the Lord. You know, if you can trust your pastor, all right? If you can't, why? Well, something's wrong. I mean, he's the man that's supposed to be faithful to the word of God, crank it out, 
to lay it out in such a way that you can examine it and then it's worthy to obey. I mean, I don't, this, is not, this is not my book. I didn't write this book. And it, I have to be diligent to be sure that what I tell you is accurate. Listen, people come to me and they've got marital problems, they've got family problems, they've got business problems, they've got all kinds of problems, and they're looking for some kind of answer from the Word of God. Do you know how burdensome that is? I can't give them just any old word because they're going to go back and make a decision on it. And they want to have the truth laid out to them in a simplistic way. It's just, it's an enormous task. And it should be. It should be. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed for the day. At least for the first half of the day. Okay? First half of the day. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. Thank you, Father, for a wonderful couple that we meet every once in a while. They come through the city and they stop off. Well, how thankful we are to know that there, there are others that have not bowed their knee to bail. Thank you, God. That are faithful to the word of God. That understand how important it is to be fed the proper meal for the proper work of ministry. I thank you for this congregation, Father, that has been faithful to fly this flag in this community and will be faithful to fly it in Moody just as soon as we can make this transition. There are people starved to death out there and don't know it. They don't know it because they've never sat down to a good meal. They've sat under bondage. They've sat in Egypt, don't know what if the promised land is about. So, Father, I pray that you give us a heart of compassion Let's be strong with the gospel of grace. And let's teach the people as we have in this congregation. Let this congregation expand itself in Jesus' name. Amen.